Studio, the Hall of Famer, Matt Miller. Matty, welcome back. Good morning. I missed the your big Orsini's event this weekend. Went down and saw Virginia Tech and Clemson play football. And while that was a lot of fun, I heard Charles' interview with PJ, and I thought, man, if there was a place to be this weekend, it would have been there. Making my stomach growl as we think about it. Yeah, and Virginia <laughs> Tech, uh, one of their quarterbacks who uh, was playing in that game was yeah. Colin Schley, who quarterbacked our 2018 team to a state championship. Yeah, he came in to replace the starter who was coming back from injury and didn't have a real good first three quarters. And in that fourth quarter, I hear that name across the PA, you know, now in a quarterback, Colin Schley. And I immediately thought of you and Oakdale and went, wait a minute. I, I remember the name of this young man who uh, is yeah. uh, a, he, a great young man and a great quarterback. He was uh, at uh, one of our games a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I saw him. I said, you still owe me 269 push-ups, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you drop an F-bomb at practice, I find you 10 push-ups. John Gilstrap, New York Times bestselling author. Good to have you, sir. Good morning. And be a telephone attorney at law, Stephen Skinner. Stephen, good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Great to have you back on the program. You will, on I think it's Thursday of this week, be involved in an event at the Stubblefield Institute with the West Virginia First Foundation involved in that as well, correct? Very excited to be a part of the panel. We're going to be talking about how the opioid settlement money in West Virginia has uh, the history of it and how the money is going to be distributed and then I think we're going to hear from the foundation's perspective about what it's doing. Stephen, I know that you were involved in many of the opioid lawsuits here in the state, and you were tied in with some of the national suits uh, as a person who was working on behalf of the people in West Virginia. Uh, are you involved specifically with the West Virginia First Foundation, or are you simply acting as a panelist who had a lot of work that you did in familiarity with the opioid situation in West Virginia? So the short answer is I don't have any role with the foundation. Um, the long answer is I was a part of the team that negotiated the creation of the foundation. And, you know, we continue, um, you know, it's my clients uh, and the rest of the local governments in West Virginia that, um, helped fund the initial part of the foundation and continue to deliver new monies to the foundation. So actually, I'm still working um, for my clients, including um, Berkeley County, to get more money um, to go both to the at the county level and to the foundation. There are a number of entities that still have not paid a dime, um, including, most uh, importantly, Purdue Pharma. Um, but that's, that's sort of another topic. So I think that this panel is largely going to be about, you know, what is happening within West Virginia in terms of what the foundation is doing today and what it's going to do in the future. And I think explaining to people in the community how the money works. And certainly I can give a perspective on the difference between the money that goes to the local governments, that is county and city, versus the money that goes to the foundation and goes out from there. Yeah, Can you track on that idea for a little while and explain those differences? Sure. So as a part of the agreement between the state, um, led by a governor like Morrissey, and the other local governments, um, we came up with a formula whereby approximately 75% of the money was going to go into the foundation, and then 25% of the money was going to go to the local governments. And we then talked about how the local governments, um, the, the guardrails we would have up about the spending um, for the foundation. And so there's a, a list of guiding principles for the foundation in terms of how the money should be spent. Um, we also spent quite a bit of time talking about how the local governments could spend the money that came to them. And, um, you know, I think that th those are the monies that are being allocated by county commissions and by cities. You know, some counties um, and cities have a significant amount of money to allocate and the the other thing that we negotiated was the ability of those local governments to essentially pay themselves back back for the money that they had advanced um, to 
fighting the epidemic. So, for example, jail bills, which really swallowed up some county commissions in, um, uh, during the crisis, um, there's, there's a way for county commissions to sort of pay themselves back and then free up funds for other things. You can imagine the financial pressure that was put on county commissions and cities to um, deal with the crisis as it happened. And that was money that they had to come up with that didn't go otherwise go to other things, like you know filling a pothole in or providing some essential service. So there's a mechanism for that that was negotiated. Um, I think we're going we're gonna to talk about the, the, the big – um, projects that the foundation can can handle because the foundation can do big big things, but it's also meant to be very surgical. So if there's a crisis um, happening in some part of the state, um, the the foundation can get in there and figure out the best response in a fast manner to try and stop it. Um, it's it's not an easy task, and it's I, I, I wish it could go faster. But um, it's it's creating the foundation, getting it staffed, getting it um, adequately adequately nimble enough to handle what's in front of it has been a pretty enormous task. And you know, a, a lot of credit to setting that up goes to Patrick Morrissey, um, who you know I, I think that um, in many ways he's going to come into the governorship um, as well informed as any governor in the country about the crisis and what's happening minute by minute uh, in the state. And um, he's got a, he's got a tall order um, as, as the, as the future governor to deal with the crisis there, but he's going to understand what the foundation can and can't do. And of course we'll have um, uh, J.B. McCuskey as a new attorney general who will have who the attorney general has a continuing role with the foundation and uh, JB has had an enormous amount of experience and understands how the foundation has set up and the um, settlement process. So I think that we're going to have a really great team um, certainly over the next four years in figuring out um, what, how to best deal with the crisis. As you all know, the crisis has has changed. The nature of opioids has changed, and it's fentanyl, and it's found creative ways to get into the system. And because of the distributions in West Virginia, the channels um, in West Virginia, you have different things happening at different times um, in different places, um, each needing a different kind of solution. So I, I I think that's what we'll we'll be um, spending our time talking about uh, on Thursday at 5:30 in the Bird Health Sciences Center Auditorium, um, 2500 Foundation Way. And do you know what time that evening will conclude, Stephen? I it I was told it would conclude by seven. So I you know I will you know I. I We'll still have enough time to have a late dinner. <laughs> Very good. Mr. Gilstrap. First, my first thought is always, do I eat before or do I eat after? <laughs> that would be mine, too. That's why I would bring a snack and eat during. Go ahead, uh, John. Right. Uh, Stephen, there's so much money pursuing so much tragedy in this opioid thing. It's, it's kind of mind-boggling. Back in June, the Supreme Court rejected a, a multi-billion dollar settlement against Purdue Pharma. Um, was from your point of view, was was that a a good thing or a bad thing in in terms of of getting money to victims and whether they're individual victims or to victims um, within the community? So that's a great great question, and it, it's it's there there are sort of two two parts to it, which is you know do I agree with the legal reasoning of the U.S. Supreme Court in, in, in its decision. Um, and I think that from, from a legal perspective, the Supreme Court did the right thing. Um, because what, what Purdue Pharma, what the Sackler family was asking for was relief from bankruptcy, even though the, the members of the Sackler family 
weren't filing bankruptcy themselves. They were trying to force a settlement down, down everybody's throats. And the Supreme Court said, if you're not filing bankruptcy, we can't force um, a release on you. So these family members who are, are billionaires knew what was going on. I mean, that, those are the allegations, knew what was going on and, um, you know, continued to profit from it. So we're so I think what the Supreme Court did was was correct um, from a, 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 a much bigger perspective. Now, does that delay the money to um, uh, across the country? Absolutely. However, you know, in the scheme of things, the amount of money that will be generated um, from a potential settlement um, with Purdue Pharma, because we're still waiting for for a reset from that, and you know, you're back to the table. You know, you're 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 looking at something that uh, is is substantial. You know, seven eight billion dollars, but um, compared to the settlements that have already occurred, um, it, it, it's 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 not as significant. So, um, and I don't even I can't even tell you the total settlements in the country right now. We're probably at forty billion dollars. Um, so it's important that we get that money, but there, um, it, it's also really important that the money that we already have gets spent well and to, to spend it irresponsibly would be a bad thing. So it is a good thing that there is a, a way for us to come up with the best solutions, which I think the foundation in West Virginia is hard at work on without feeling the pressure to have to spend the money. So this money is going to come in at some point and it's going to further our efforts here in, in West Virginia at an appropriate time, I think, because we, we per capita uh, received the most money in the country. Um, and we would all are, you know, fairly seriously argue that the reason why we received the most per capita is because we were harmed the most per capita. And um, the getting the money in 10 years um, versus tomorrow isn't going to probably change much of what the foundation is going to do. So uh, it is disappointing because there was a settlement um, already completed but I don't think that that's going to change much in terms of West Virginia. Is it fair to say that we can draw a line from the fentanyl crisis we have now back to the oxy crisis when this first began? Is, is one the cause of the other? Uh, oh, well, I think we need to even jump back further than that, um, much further than that, and look at the, the history of opioids in the world and the wars that have been fought over it and the fact that we have always known that th this is an addictive substance and, uh, and people can make a lot of money off of it anytime you can get someone addicted to something right you can you you get a customer for life that's cigarette smoking um and we <laughs> we see that there was a thirst that got quenched uh, in America at the beginning of the crisis. And we haven't found our way out of that yet. And there are folks that would argue that, you know, what Purdue Pharma um, did, the Chinese are now doing um, for the country. Um, I mean, there, I don't think you have to talk, when you start talking to people out there about our crisis today, you start, having i i am not in any way shape or form a conspiracy theorist but um i think that the fact that um the fentanyl continues to um come into the country primarily i think from china and that it, a lot of it just gets shipped here in the mail um there there is a clear line back to um, what Purdue Pharma was doing, and what does what does what 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 happens to us when we have a huge amount of our population 
that are, have substance abuse disorder and are trying to can, cannot escape opioids. And what happens if you know we have to spend our infrastructure, our money around dealing with substance abuse rather than in um, innovation and education? Um, you know, it puts us at a, a big disadvantage. So I think that there are. Um, it's it's everything is connected here, and um, fentanyl is just and for for the folks listening who don't know, fentanyl is just a synthetic opioid that is relatively easy to manufacture and is manufactured all over China, and we have a government in China that is turning a blind eye to it, and you know some would say that it is a very intentional blind eye. Yeah, I, I think that it is effectively, I think it was Patrick Morris who first called it terrorism. Mm -hmm. I think it's an intentional effort to rot our culture from within. And I, I don't think it's an accident that these uh, labs are in China and this product is being shipped to America. I, you know, I, 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 I like that conversation because, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, we... we the, the the Chinese government has has not addressed it in the way that it should, and um, we 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 need to insist upon it. And it is it is it, is it terrorism? Absolutely. You know, this is a security issue, and um, we can't. It is nearly impossible for us to stop it coming into the country, especially when you think about the volume of packages entering this country from China. I mean, it is, it is astounding. I don't think people understand the scale of it, what it would take to, um, to, to stop it coming in that way. So you gotta stop it somewhere else, and you, you're gonna need to, to really focus on um, the manufacturers in China or wherever I mean, it could be coming from Canada, and I understand some of it does come from Canada. Not that I think that the Canadians are out to have us rot, but um, we, we, we cannot have the volume of trade with China and expect that we're going to be able to stop the fentanyl. I make my living as a conspiracy theorist, and um, <laughs> uh, the, the research I do, there's a lot of people look in a lot of different ways to, I, I believe, can't prove anything, don't want to prove anything um, necessarily. That's not what I do, but um, our war on drugs has never been a war on drugs. There's, there's a lot of money being made by a lot of people getting this stuff into the country. Absolutely. I don't, you know, I, the war on drugs, I mean, do you call it a failure? It's a pillow I mean, fight on drugs. I think it's, it's a, um, I mean, many, many people would because it has not been effective. And um, we're hoping that we, if we do use an evidence-based approach to substance abuse in West Virginia, that we're going to have um, the best solutions in the country. And that is not just in treatment, but in prevention. And I think that uh, in terms of prevention, I don't know that what we, we kids of the 80s, we Gen Xers, um, who heard what was, you know, the, the propaganda at the time about saying no to drugs, it was not effective. And there has to be a different way of dealing with it. And let's hope that we have some of the best, um, um, the best ways of dealing with it. You know, we can also look at the vast, vast quantities of money that was spent uh, and continues to be spent in tobacco prevention. And you know, was it was it effective? Well, certainly tobacco use is way, way, way down. But is it because of public health campaigns, advertising campaigns, PR? Or is it because um, it's become, you know, pretty incredibly expensive and people have somehow understood those risks and we just don't have it? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know any of these. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I, I love to have these conversations, but, of course, 
I'm the lawyer. I'm not a scientist and certainly no longer a politician. So that's true. But I, these are the these are the things that I like talking about. Things have changed dramatically since you last served in the legislature in terms of representation there, Stephen. No question, no question about to, that. To say the least. <laughs> <laughs> Understatement of the year. I've got 30 seconds left. Give me, the uh, again, the recap of Thursday evening. Uh, Thursday evening, uh, a, a, a large panel of folks, including the new leader of the West Virginia First Foundation that starts at 5.30, goes till 7.00. And that's going to be at the Robert C. Byrd Health Sciences Center. We still have a few things named after Senator Byrd in the state. Um, that's and hope, hope to see folks come out. Stephen, thank you, and enjoy your late dinner after that event. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Good to be on. Good to have you, sir. Stephen Skinner at uh, 9.57 or 5.57 if you're listening to the replay later this evening here. <laughs>